اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم هو الله الذي لا اله الا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا اله الا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله مولانا العظيم We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name Allah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and Al-Malik and the reason I'm reminding is, inshallah, for us to keep on memorizing these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, it may happen that we feel that it's easy. And I can catch up later on. And at the end, we find ourselves not being able to do it just like many other things in our lives. So it's always the best that as we go along, we keep on memorizing these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially the ones that we cover each session and each week. Today, inshallah, we will talk about some other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that comes next. And as I mentioned earlier, that we are following the order that comes into the hadith, which is in Sunan at Tirmizi. And in that hadith, the one that comes after a malik is Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Al-Quddus mean? Normally it's translated as holy. But I don't really know what understanding we normally get when we hear the word holy. Because we hear this word used for different things. Wallahu alam, people who are familiar with the language, what feeling they, they get that comes associated with this word itself. But to me, it looks like is not what we are supposed to get by the name Al Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is only because. The use of the words in different languages, it all depends on how people of that language, those who are used to speaking the language, use that word, where it's used, and then at the same time, for what it is being used. If the use of the word is very common, the, na- the meaning may be very great, but if the use is very common and they use it for anything, to mention the greatness of something, to mention that something is big, mention something is great, then of course, we lose the effect of the meaning of that word. So, al quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does it mean in the language itself, in Arabic language? This word is driven from the word qaf dal sin. Qadasa. Quddus is driven from Qadas and Qadasa in Arabic language means to be pure, to be clean. Anything that is pure and clean is Qadas. And then the form Quddus simply means extremely clean. When it's used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to understand that we can never understand how pure and glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. We will only be using examples that be fitting our understanding in our mind and looking at things that are clean or pure within our world. So we are able to understand at least the meaning of the word, not the exact 
application of it when it comes to the word being used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we think of purest thing in this world, the purest thing in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than that. And everything in this world, no matter how pure it is, there is something affiliated with it, attached to it, that makes it impure. Whatever that thing might be. So, we will be only using examples to understand the application of the word, the meaning of the word, but when it comes to the application of the word in the sense of applying it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then of course we have to remember Allah is greater and more holy, more pure than what we can understand. In Arabic language, Qudus is used for a big bucket also. If we, there is a huge bucket, not normal buckets, they don't use the word Qudus for normal buckets, but if the bucket is too huge, they use the word Qudus for it. And the reason for it is because it simply means this is a size of bucket that takes so much water that will purify anything that will get into it. So again, the word purity is applied over there. When we use this word for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it simply refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pure from all kind of impurities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from any defect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from any association where he is in need of something, where he is in need of someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from having a beginning or having an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from having any need for himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. So purity in all senses, which means there is no defect and there is no impurity whatsoever affiliated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To think about that, to be able to imagine what does it really mean, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi says, that think of something extremely pure, extremely pure and clean, where we think that this thing may not have any bad smell, this thing does not have any defect, this, this thing does not have anything attached to it that will make people feel bad, I mean, everything is pure, clean, perfect. And we, will real, we need to realize that all of that, after having that thing in our mind, that thing is still defective because it's something that will have an end to it. And that by itself is a defect for something to have an end, for its purity, for its existence. If something is clean and pure, and it will not get unclean, but one day it will finish. One day, this thing will finish. So of course, it simply means that there is a defect in it. The purity of this thing is very limited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no limits to his being Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Any perfume that we use, the fragrance of that perfume will not last forever. It has certain time after which it's going to end. That's it. No more smell in it, no more fragrance. Apply bottles of perfume on yourself. People will be able to smell a lot of fragrance, <coughs> very high fragrance, but after some days, it's all going to go away. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> that nothing that is affiliated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any of his attributes, any of his qualities, anything that is affiliated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those things always remain pure and clean. <coughs> it leads us to another very important thing that many times we don't pay any attention to it, and that is our ruh. But inshallah we'll come to it a little later. First thing, 
I would just like to explain this word Quddus as it applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Quddus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Quddus from everything, from even having anything that would resemble Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if anything resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the only Quddus. Then there is something else that is as pure and as clean. <coughs> but of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only Quddus of that type that where there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say nothing like Allah, not only in the ibadah of Allah, not only in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing can be Quddus like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pure like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we go for Hajj, sometimes a question comes to people's mind that they don't find any answer to it, but they follow it. Knowing that it's an order, okay, let me just follow it. But they don't find any answer to it by knowing this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would find a great answer for that question also that troubles many people. <laughs> And that is, during the days of Hajj, when you are in your Ihram, there are so many things that we are not able to do. So many things that are forbidden during Ihram. <coughs> we cannot wear regular clothing. Okay, we may find some reason for it. Equality, all people will look same. There are no difference between rich and poor. And a lot of other things, reminding you of your coffin, reminding you of your death keeping all of our dunya behind. But when it comes to the use of perfume, atr, we find that if you use it, you have to pay penalty. It's a sin to use perfume intentionally during ihram. It's forbidden. Now, when this question comes to people's mind, many times they cannot digest this thing here, that why perfume is not allowed. Islam is a clean religion. Islam teaches us purity. Islam teaches us to be clean. And of course, we see that in the teachings of Islam. So how come then at this time, Islam said, don't even use that perfume. We can understand when we look at this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala, that although to cover up some of our defects, we may use some perfume. Use of the perfume is for covering our defect, showing our need for these nice, good fragrance. What is it beyond this? If we say that really the person is not, has no bad smell, no defect, and no need, then he wouldn't need no perfume. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his attachment with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala was such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him so pure and clean that even the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to have fragrance in it. That's his attachment with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now the question is, how come in Ihram we are not able to use it? Because, remember, this atr, this perfume that we use, after all, it's something from this dunya. We are using something of this dunya to cover up some of our shortcomings, some of our defects, or just to enjoy, which is another defect within human beings, that they always have different feelings and their uh, feelings go so low now to get higher, they may use some atr, some perfumes, these type of things. In those days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants people to just cut off from this dunya. Cut yourself off this dunya so much that don't even go after these atr, <coughs> just run after the Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. All you're doing is from Mecca, he says, leave Mecca, go to that desert in Mina. Then from Mina, go even further away and go to Arafat, go to Muzdalifa. Spend your days over there in Arafat, spend your night in Muzdalifa. 
What are you doing there? Just detaching yourself, keeping away from all of this dunya. And the only connection that person has now is with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it shows the need for us to really have our connection with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala and disconnecting from the worldly things. That is a lesson that really gives us some higher level of this connection where a person leaves everything. Connection with anything is not allowed. Connection with your family is not allowed. Connection with your clothing is not allowed. Just enough to cover our sutter and that is also with some restrictions and conditions. And don't even cut your nails. Don't even cut your hair. Don't even use any other or perfume on yourself. Toothpaste has fragrance in it, don't use it. Any type of fragrance, don't use it. Totally cutting ourselves off of anything that is of this dunya. And, of course, when the person will be cutting himself of this dunya, then his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting stronger. So this leads us to another point over here, and that is our connection with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to connect our souls. As we see from this example of Hajj, that if you really would like to be connected to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala, then purify your heart from all other connections. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look, look at your face, at your look. That if you are better, if you look, is, you look better, more handsome, prettier, then you are dearer to Allah. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your hearts and your a'mal. And in Quran al-Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us at the beginning of Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put two hearts in the chest of any human beings. Every human being has one heart. What does it mean to tell us something about medicine that no doctor will have to do any research if any human being carries two hearts so we can take borrow one from him? No, it's not for that reason. It's to tell us that our attachment will be only with one thing. Either we attach ourselves to this dunya or we attach ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the hearts are attached to this dunya, then they cannot be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there are so many other attachments over there. And Allah is pure. Everything in this world has some impurity in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like those impurities. Therefore, if the heart has all of these impurities, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not come into that heart. He wants the clean place. He wants us to keep our hearts clean for His sake. So that our hearts can be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why do we keep masajid clean and why there is so much order of keeping everything clean in the masjid? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon seeing some dirt in the masjid, how upset he was. For a woman who used to clean the masjid, he gave her the guarantee of the jannah and maghfirah after she passed away. Because these are the places that are used for attaching ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they should be clean. And more than the places is our heart through which we have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when this heart is not clean, then it does not establish that connection with Allah. And this heart will use some other means for connection. Just like for seeing things in this world, we use our eyes and then once we see them with our eyes, then we carry that love for those things in our hearts. So if the eyes are not clean and pure, the eyes carry a lot of impurities in them. These eyes 
cannot be used then for connecting ourselves to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's pure. Our hands, if they are not pure from sins, then they will not be used for doing the deeds that will connect ourselves to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. If our tongue is not pure, it cannot be used for things that will connect us to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can very well understand if a person has some blood, some urine on a spoon, and he would like to take carry some sweet with that spoon and put it in our mouth, telling us here, take some sweet, we won't take it because we see that impurity in it. If we don't allow that in our mouth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Quddus much more pure than we are. And then we can understand, if our tongue is full of sins, is full of ghibah, backbiting, is full of cursing at others, if our tongue is full of using loose talk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow this tongue to be reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't want that tongue to be used for that. He keeps it away from it. See the ayah of Quran now, where Allah says, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. Only pure and clean people can touch this book of Allah. Now we can see the secret behind us not being able to go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these are the words of Allah. And when we fill our tongue with dirt, our eyes with that najasa of the sins, our hands are full of those dirt, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just stay away from my book. Don't touch it, don't see it, don't recite it. More than this, when our hearts are full of all kind of najasa and worse najasa than we can see with our physical eyes. The najasa of the sins, remember, is worse than any other najasa that we can see in this life. The impurity of these sins and the worst is shirk. is so najis, is so najis, so dirty that it can never be cleaned with even with that fire, the only thing that clean it, that can clean it is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is Al-Quddus. <laughs> Allah is Al-Quddus. Only His name can purify the heart from the najasa of the sins. Therefore, those who depart this world without using that name of Allah for purifying their heart, they will have no other means of using it, of cleaning their heart in Akhirah. And this is why Quran again and again says, They belong to hellfire, they will remain there forever. Because Jannah is a clean place. Jannah is a place where there is no dirt, no najasa can enter into that place. And shirk is a najasa that cannot be purified with anything that is over there. Therefore, that will not be able to clean. But other sins, like arrogance, like jealousy, like hatred, and all other type of sins that we carry within our souls. These are the sins that of course are not allowed in Jannah. A person who carries these things in his heart will not be able to carry them into Jannah. Jannah is not a place for it. It has to be purified and clean. Either we purify it in this world or in Akhirah, it can be purified in two different ways. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showering the rahmah on the person's heart that will just purify everything from this person's heart. Number two, that person going into Jahannam for some time and purifying all of these things through the fire of Jahannam and once that these things are cleaned, then this person will be taken out of Jahannam and will be able to go into Jannah. Before this, there was so much najasa on his heart that he could not go into Jannah. So now we see our relationship with 
and our connection with Al Quddus Subhanahu wa Taala that is pure. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is pure, and He likes us to keep everything pure. And in order for us to keep everything pure, we need to keep our body pure from all kind of dirt, physical and spiritual. Which means there are three types of najasa that we need to keep ourselves clean of those. Number one is the physical najasa that anyone can see, it. physical impurities, anyone can see it. There is some blood, sorry, there is some urine, there is something else on the body, on the cloth, clean it, keep yourself clean. So it's really part of our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't allow any najasa on ourselves. We stay clean and pure. Number two, the najasa which we cannot see, the najasa that we cannot see, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that if you do certain things, you will have some najasa on your body that you will not be able to see, but you can clean it by using water. And that is why we perform wudu and we make ghusl when it becomes fard on us. This type of impurity, those who do not have divine religion will not have no sense of it will not be able to understand what does it mean. Yes, those who have a divine religion, they understand that there is that type of impurity. This is why the people of book, Christians and Jews, according to their book, they understand that there are some impurities which we cannot see. It's on the body of the person and the person has to wash himself or herself to get rid of those impurities. And of course, Bible is very strict about it. Simple example, it talks about when a woman is unclean during some days. Bible says about it that the impurity is so gross, is so much that if she would touch something and a man will touch that thing, she touched the door and the man touched that door just by man touching that door, he will be impure and unclean for the whole day for 24 hours. What najasa is that? This is the impurity that cannot be seen. And for that, as I said, Islam, of course, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very simple and easy for us. And wudu and ghusl, depending on what type of impurity the person is in, wudu or ghusl will clean the person from those impurities. And therefore, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommends and he advises us that always have wudu. Always keep your wudu. Why? Connection with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is Quddus. So as more you keep yourself pure and clean, the more your connection will be established with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah does not like things that are not clean. So when the person is always having wudu, and this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would always have wudu. Even he teaches us when you're going to bed, of course for us, as soon as you fall asleep, your wudu is broke according to the rule of the Sharia. But still the recommendation is when you go to bed, have wudu. It may break, but at least before going to your bed, have wudu. It's a sign that even when you are laying in your bed, you are establishing, you want to keep that connection with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will remind you of Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. See the connection now. Our connection with Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the second type of impurity. The third type of impurities are the impurities of the sins, which is worse than these first two impurities. The impurity of the sins. And the worst of those is shirk and kufr. But less than that is any type of sin is an impurity. And when these type of impurities start getting into the heart, the heart starts breaking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is Al-Quddus. 
And this is why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although He made our body from this dirt, and this body will go back into the dirt, but our ruh is not made out of dirt. Our ruh is not made out of dirt. The ruh comes from up. When I blow my ruh into him, this ruh was not taken from this earth. This is why when a person dies, this dirt goes into the dirt. The ruh is taken up. Now it depends. If the person kept his ruh pure and clean from all kind of the najasa of the shirk and sins, this ruh will be allowed to go up and be there in a clean place. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mutawfifin, كَلَّا إِنَّ كِتَابَ الْأَبْرَارِ لَفِي عَلِّيِّينَ The record of the virtuous people would be, will be in عَلِّيِّينَ عَلِّيِّينَ in a high place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if that ruh is impure, we have applied a lot of sins and the najasa of the sins on this ruh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَنَا القدوس, I'm قُدُّوسِ I cannot allow this impurity over here with me. Then he sends this ruh to somewhere else, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about, which he says in Surah Al-Mutafifin again, كَلَّا إِنَّ كِتَابَ الْفُجَّارِ لَفِي سِجِّينَ that the record of the criminals, of the wrongdoers, will be in Sijin. And as described in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that it's a place below the earth, where all the arwah of the sinners are kept over there. So the ruh comes from there. As we understand this point, now the next point is very easy to understand, and that is, as this physical body comes from dirt. Therefore, the nourishment for it also comes from dirt. All type of our nourishment, food, whatever we eat, lotions, creams, medicine, uh, whatever we use for our physical body comes from the dirt. But Ruh, our soul, did not come from the dirt. It came from up. Therefore, the nourishment for it also comes from up. And that nourishment is the deen of Allah. That Allah sent in a form of wahi revelation. The revelation did not come from the earth. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. came down. And this is why Allah again and again says in Quran, reminds us of this very beautiful fact that inna nahnu zikr. We have sent down this reminder for you people. We have sent down this Qur'an for you people. All of these things, these things came from up, from the same place where the ruh came from. So, you need to nourish this ruh. It won't be through this food that we eat and anything from anything that comes from this earth. It will be from the nourishment that is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of Qur'an in the form of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. All of these are nourishments for our soul because this is the dhikr of Allah that comes from up. Recite any ayah of Quran is the dhikr of Allah. This is the nourishment for our ruh. If the ruh is misbehaving, then we need to treat it. The treatment is not by any medicine that we can get from this world, from this earth. It is a medicine that, is, that have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that have come from up. So the physical body came from dirt. All the necessities of this physical body are fulfilled from this dirt. The ruh came from up. All the necessities of this ruh have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from up. And this is why. This is why. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, beautiful hadith, but we can understand the application of this hadith 
in this context very easily now. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ كَمَثَلِ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّدِ The example of those who remember Allah, they are like living people, and those who don't remember Allah are like dead people. Why are they like dead people? The ruh is dead. We go to the hospital. You see a person on a life support is not able to breathe himself. We come back, we say he's just like a dead person. His physical body is giving up. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who used to treat the ruh of human beings, who was sent mainly for that, not to give us physical medicine for physical bodies. He was sent to give us the medicine to treat our ruh. He told us, that when you don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gradually your ruh starts dying. And then this person spiritually becomes like a dead person. Finally, it gets to the stage that this is a body that lives only for dunya, does not understand akhirah. Do we see it now? Do we see where all of this is coming from? When we see people who we try to talk to, we try to explain to him, but nothing, nothing that will move this person, nothing will make him, this person understand. This person does not understand anything of that world, doesn't understand nothing about his ruh, the ruh is dead. All he understands is of this dunya. Talk to him about some profit in this worldly thing. That if you do this, if you, tomorrow, if you come to me tomorrow night, Make sure you come to me at midnight, 12 o'clock. And I have someone coming to me with a very special techniques of making some money and investing your money because we are losing so much money. And there is a person coming and he's telling us some secrets about it. Come and we will be spending a few hours. This person will sacrifice rest, anything and everything for it. Make sure you don't even tell your family. Okay, I won't. And then even the wife doesn't know where he has gone. Children don't know where he's gone because he was told not to tell his family. But subhanAllah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about some gain, some benefit, some profit, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about it, we don't understand it. Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi wa sallam, when they left everything behind in Makkah, they came to Medina Munawwara. The munafiqeen, they were not able to really understand that situation. For what reason in the world would you leave all of that dunya behind? You had so much, you had your wealth, you had your families, you had your houses, you had your businesses. Why did you leave all of that behind? Now those people are going to benefit from it. Yes, it makes sense. But it makes sense for us who have that connection with this. We don't realize by giving up those things, what did they get? What, establish, what connection they established? They established their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when Suhaib radiallahu anhu arrived in Quba, the wordings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were, Rabihat tijaratun Suhaib. Rabihat tijaratun Suhaib. Suhaib, you did a very successful business. You did a very profitable business, O Suhaib. So, ruh comes from up. The nourishment for it comes from up there. If we really would like to keep our ruh alive, we have to practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to always be attached to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will keep our ruh alive. And the best form of it is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us simply means following the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam following the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is the best nourishment for our ruh. Best nourishment for our ruh is keep up with the sunnahs and with the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which, of course, part of it is dua for everything that we do. Dua for leaving home, dua for entering home, dua for entering the bathroom, dua for leaving, coming out of the bathroom, dua for before we eat, before we dua while we are eating, dua after we eat, dua for entering the masjid, dua for entering the marketplace, dua for going to sleep, dua for having a relationship with our families. Subhanallah, dua for everything. What is this? Keeping that ruh alive. That regardless of what we are doing, the ruh has to be alive. 
And we have to keep on nourishing it. Just like when we feel hungry, we eat. And we know ourselves how many times we drink and eat in a day. Now, let us go one step higher now to understand another point. For those of us who make our ruh, our body, very strong and ruh weak, we have seen that the result of it, we get disconnected from deen. We get disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our connection with dunya keeps on getting stronger and our life finally becomes only for dunya. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, there are people who live ulaika kalanam, who live like animals, in fact, worse than animals. Because when human beings start living only for dunya, they don't stay at the limits where animals would stop. Which means, just eat, have rest, and wake up and find some, find some more food, and be nice to each other. Human beings go beyond those limits. Then we start trying to hurt each other, pulling everything from others, and do every wrong in the world that animals would never do. We have never heard that lions saying to each other, look, we are the strongest animals and we are stronger than human beings and these animals, these human beings are so bad or these other animals are so bad. Let's all of us get together and form our army and we will go and destroy those nations one after another. Lions do, don't, don't do that. Snakes don't do that. Scorpions don't do that. Individually they may hurt people or hurt someone, something else. But they don't get into that to that level where human beings will get to. So this is why Allah says, they are not, when human beings go in that direction, they are not only like animals, balhum adal. In fact, they, comes, they become worse than animals. This is when the body starts getting strong and ruh starts getting weak. If we go the other way, when the ruh starts getting strong and body is getting weak. And I don't mean really weakness in the physical body where the person is not able to do anything. No, Rasulullah recommended us that المؤمن القوي خير وحب إلى الله من المؤمن الضعيف. That a strong mu'min is dearer to Allah than a weak mu'min. And strength means in every sense. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not apply any restriction. But the condition is, he's a mu'min, which means the strength is used for iman. Of course, this is the, if, I don't want to go into those details. According to Arabic grammar, المؤمن القوي simply means a mu'min whose quwa is used for iman. Whose strength is used for iman. It's not that doing so much exercise and then at time of salah you go to sleep because he's so tired after all of that exercise. So, strength. Because that strength can be used for iman. But the point is, when the ruh gets strong, at that time, these ruh will always manipulate. And ruh will tell the body what to do. The body will not tell the ruh what to do. For us, in most of our cases, our body tells the ruh. Let's go to sleep. We say, okay, let's go to sleep. The body says, you need more rest. Don't wake up for Salat al-Fajr. Okay, let's go to sleep. And I won't wake up. The body says, you're tired, you cannot fast. We'll say, okay, I'm not going to fast. The body says, you're tired, you cannot recite Qur'an. Okay, I won't recite. I will have rest. I will have tea. I will eat food. But for some other people who have worked on the ruh, the ruh manipulates the body and tells the body that you have to get up. And the body, although it may complain for some time that I'm weak, you have to get up. And he gets up. The body has no say in it. Now you see the secret. When you hear the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is performing salat al tahajjud and his feet are swollen. How can ever a person think a human being would be able to stand on swollen feet? Feet that are swollen. How can you stand on these feet? There is water full in there. There, is, there may be pus full in there. How can you even touch it? Forget about standing and putting your weight on it. And then, is standing on it for so long that he's reciting seven, eight juz, nine, ten juz while he's standing on these swollen feet. Why? The body says, I'm swollen, I'm hurt, I'm in pain. 
The ruh says that I need some nourishment. Get up, I need some food. Recite some Quran. The ruh defeats the body. In our case, the body defeats the ruh. So if we would like to get that, this is what we need to do. Make your ruh strong. Keep on doing so much for your ruh. Keep on nourishing it, giving it some vitamins. Keep on giving it a lot of vitamins, which is, as I said, the tilawah of Quran, the remembrance of Allah, the following of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. All of these are vitamins for the body. Keep on giving it all of these vitamins. Make it so strong that it will tell the body, now at this time I'm hungry, I need food, and the body has to say, oh yes sir, okay, let's go. So this is the attachment, this is the relationship between the ruh and the body. The reason this point came up and I was explaining it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a quddus. He gave us our ruh that is that came from up, did not make it from this dirt because had it been made from this dirt, it will always stay dirty at least to a certain level. Just like our body, no matter how, you, how much you clean it, inside it is full of blood. Inside it, there is so much dirt in there, so, so, much, so much najasa in there, that if you open the body, we won't be able to smell it, we won't be able to touch it, we won't be able to look at it. Ruh is not like that. Allah gave us something pure and clean, so that if we keep it pure, through our ruh, our attachment will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it came from up, it's pure and clean, you can keep it pure. And now, understand another hadith, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. Every child is born pure and clean. Which means, at the time of birth, there is no impurity on this ruh. This ruh is pure. Then, because of doing other things that we do in our life, the impurity starts getting on this ruh. The gist of it to understand what Al-Quddus means for us, simply keeping ourselves clean and pure from all type of najasas. Keeping our physical body clean as much as we can. Keeping our ruh clean. No najasa of the sins. Keeping it clean and pure from all kind of impurities of the sins. So that we are able to connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the month of Ramadan, we fast. Because of this fasting, we realize that our connection with our deen gets very strong. Everyone feels it. Our connection with Quran gets stronger. Our connection with the sunnah, with the ibadah, with the salah, with everything gets strong. The effect of that fasting. Why? In fasting, you are staying away from a lot of things of this dunya. You are detaching yourself from this, so you are attaching yourself from, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with al quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, as we see now, Hajj, we see uh, Saum, fasting, and Zakah. All of these things, what is Zakah? You give up something, which means you're showing that I don't have that connection. For your sake, I will give up this. Salah, don't eat, don't drink, don't look here and there. What is all of this? Detach yourself from everything else, attach yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when these scholars are asked that what is the hikmah? What is the hikmah? What is the wisdom behind raising the hands at the beginning of salah? They tell us. Raising the hands means that indication I'm throwing everything behind my back. My whole dunya, there is nothing that that's Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. I'm attaching myself to Allah. No more eating, no more drinking, no more even looking here and there. That's it. Stay away from everything. Full devotion to the ibadah and towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, our connection with Al-Quddus simply means we need to keep all the other things out of our heart. Does, this does not mean we are not allowed to live in this dunya and do anything in this dunya. No. Use anything. Use whatever you need. Use everything of this dunya that is halal for you to use. But don't let it get into your heart. Keep it out of the heart. That heart, keep it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are a lot of other accounts where you can keep your money. Why do we have to put that money into our hearts? And attach our hearts so much into it that after a loss of $100, the person doesn't even feel like performing salah. 
And after missing five prayers a day, he doesn't really never, we never feel that I don't want to earn today, I don't want to go to work because I missed my salah. After missing salah, you don't want to lose money. But after losing money, you want to miss the salah. So keep it up. This is what exactly it means. Al-Quddus, attachment to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we should keep our hearts from all other attachments and attach our hearts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Connect, connect your heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, those who attach their hearts to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala, their stage, their level of attachment becomes such that their heart does not look here and there. Their heart does not look, does not look here and there. How many times we find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is hungry. There is nothing to eat at home. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that situation, what he was doing and what he taught the ummah to do, what he taught the sahaba to do, and of course, and, uh, that's his teaching as to do is, first thing, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let your heart to be attached with anything else. Attach your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Quddus, pure and clean. He would like our heart to remain pure from all type of impurities and even from all type when you get to a higher level, from all type of connection that will break our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and answer Allah. And this dunya, everything is, is this dunya is impure. Therefore, keep it out of your heart. Keep it out. Keep it in your pocket. Keep it in your dunya. Use it. But keep it out of your heart so that our attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep on getting stronger and stronger. And this is Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attribute of Allah that comes after this, after Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala is As-Salam. As-Salam, many times is translated as the provider of peace. But really, there may be some better words to express the meanings of As-Salam than the word peace or provider of peace when it's used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salama yaslimu or salima yaslimu in Arabic language means to be safe. To be safe from something, from anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we have just learned, he is as-salam because he's safe from all kind of defects. No defect can get to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, every safety comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every safety comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can use any mean of protection, of saving, our, saving ourselves from any type of hardships, difficulties, disease whatsoever. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not protect that person, that person will not be saved. We try to protect ourselves from things that can attack us from outside, then something all of a sudden from within the body comes up. The person who protected himself with all kind of things, using all technologies, all of a sudden finds out that a cancer developed from within the body. Did not come from anywhere out there. as is the one who provides all kind of safety. In this world, really, we like to use a lot of means of safety. New construction, they won't allow you to build without fire alarm system, and you have to have sprinkler systems, and you have to have smog detectors, and then all kinds of things. And you have to have doors, and uh, uh, fire exits, and signs, and emergency door exits, whatsoever. But of course, the real safety is the one that is provided to us by As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before all of these things were developed, he was saving people, saving people from these things. And even now, he's saving people from things. And if he decides for any group of people, for any nation, for any person, 
that this person has to be affected by something or has to depart this world or has to be in a situation, there is nothing can save that person from that situation. So, if a person really would like to have that safety, then the attachment is with As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala will do that. And As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Islam, which is driven from the same word. Gave us Islam. Islam guarantees safety for people. This is why this is Islam. Allah is As-Salam. You attach yourself to As-Salam through Islam. And when you come to Islam, you are getting into something that will save you. Sa safety from what? From the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the worst thing that can affect people and hurt people. There is nothing worse than that, that can destroy people and destroy nations. And not only in this dunya, in this dunya and akhirah. The anger of Allah. You are safe from the anger of Allah through Al-Islam only. So As-Salam provides us with this Islam, which is a guarantee for the safety. And Islam has so much safety in it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, when you see any person who is in Islam, say to him, As-Salamu alaykum. Which simply refers to that you are safe. And it's mainly a dua that may Allah always save you. As-salamu alaykum. We use the word peace. In reality, the word safety may be better than peace when we are translating the word salam because in Arabic language there is another word that refers to peace better than salam and that is iman. Here we need to remember Believers, we have we use two words for them, Muslim and Mu'min. And see the connection now, safety and protection. Safety and peace. Iman is peace. Islam is safety and protection. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in the hadith, Al-Muslimu man salim al nas min lisanihi wa yadihi. Muslim is the person from whose tongue and hand people are safe. وَالْمُؤْمِنُ مَنْ أَمِنَهُ النَّاسُ عَلَىٰ دِمَائِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ And a mu'min is the person that people are in peace from this person are taking, taking their blood or taking their wealth. Safety and peace from Iman and from Islam. So this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the deen of Islam, is the deen of Iman, is the deen of safety, and is the deen of protection, where we know that once we are in this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this deen will teach us how we should be safe and how others should be safe from us. So many hadiths. I won't go into the details, otherwise we will lose this connection here of As-Salam. But there are so many hadiths. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that if you are a Muslim, for you to be a Muslim and to be in this Islam, people should be safe from your hand and from your tongue. Our connection with As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala breaks when that safety is not there. When we are not safe from our own hardships, when we are not safe ourselves, people around us are not safe from our own evils. When human beings are committing these evils and going into the fitness, they don't just destroy their people around them, they even destroy themselves. A person who, will, who is in the house and he's putting on a fire on that house, he is going to burn himself also as he will burn people around him. A person who has the habit of creating fitna, he is not only destroying others, because of that fitna that he's creating, he's destroying himself also. Islam teaches us that no, others should be safe, you should be safe. 
Don't get into fitness. Don't start a fitna. If there is a fitna, don't involve yourself. Don't get into that fitna. Stay away from it. You should always be safe and you should always look for safety. And through that, our connection will be established with As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala, where there is always safety. This is why Jannah is called Darus Salam. The place where everyone is safe. Always safe. There will be no disease over there. There will be no hardship over there. There will be no death over there. Allah will, ne will never get angry with people over there. It's always safety from every difficulty, every hardship. It's Darus Salam. This dunya cannot be Darus Salam. We cannot be safe from everything in this dunya. But by following this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will learn how to bring safety in this world. And how this sense of being safe from each other will exist in the minds and the hearts of human beings. And really, I won't go into that topic, but if we look at the moral systems of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching us our akhlaq, our moralities, behaviors, how to think about others, how to talk about others, how to deal with each other, how to meet each other. Subhanallah, there is so much over there that if we just follow these instructions of the Sharia, there will always be peace. It's only because we are running away from it, we are in hardship and others are in hardship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a salam, which means he is safe from all type of defects. No defects can get to him. And his safety is so great that he even provides safety for human beings. And of course, the highest level of safety is through his iman, through his Islam. This is why it's called this deen of Allah. It's called Islam, the deen of safety. When a person comes into this deen, will learn how to be saved from the adab of Allah and how others can be saved from this person, how he himself can be saved from his own evils so that he won't put into him, himself into hardships and into difficulties. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the tawfeeq to always be connected to Al-Quddus subhanahu wa ta'ala by keeping our souls, our hearts, our soul, our soul clean and pure. Always keep hatred, jealousy, and animosity, all of these type of, type of things, arrogance, whatsoever we, uh, many times we have in our hearts, keep it out there, out of the heart. Otherwise, our connection with Al-Quddus will not be able to, we will, won't be able to establish it because he is Al-Quddus, he's pure, and he does not like these impurities and these najasas. And we need to establish ourselves with uh, our relationship with As-Salam subhanahu wa ta'ala by having peace for everyone, by having safety for everyone so that people are safe from all of our hardships and our evils and we are safe from our own hardships and our evils. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين